Chrissy here. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, it's great to see such a great uh, turnout today. My name is Seb Crutch. I'm one of the psychologists here at Rare Dementia Support and the Dementia Research Centre. And it's a real pleasure to welcome you for, I can't, I've lost track of how many joint care meetings we've had, um, but you're extremely welcome. So there are members here. We have a color coding scheme, as a few of you will have noticed on the way in. Um, I'm not very good at describing colours, but essentially if you're looking for someone else uh, who might be in a similar situation to you, then those with a sort of green or lime green um, badge um, are likely to have some sort of personal experience of familial Alzheimer's disease. Um, I'm just not showing up terribly clear in the slides, but I think red um, is for people who have had some personal connection with frontotemporal dementia. Uh, purple f with familial frontotemporal dementia, that's the form that runs in families. Uh, I think yellow, limey yellow for PCA, posterior cortical atrophy, the visual dementia. Uh, blue for primary progressive aphasia, the language dementias. Um, and I think orangey color for dementia with Lewy bodies. Um, so if you've not joined us before, it may be that quite a few of the words I just used um, aren't familiar to you or the terms aren't familiar. And I think that's one of the real um, uh, pleasures but also challenges of a group like today where people have an experience of supporting someone with a rarer dementia but it may not be exactly the same one. There are many different forms. Um, but we often find that um, by coming together, by sharing, there may be some things um, here which are really helpful and practical and relevant to your experience. There may be other things less so, either because someone's living with a different condition or perhaps at a different stage on their journey. So we hope, as always, that you would take what's valuable to you. Um, don't feel ob obliged to take on board everything that is said. It may not be for you. It may be that something is said or uttered for someone else. 
um, but please do take what, what is useful. I have a very few quick uh, announcements. The usual about fire extinguishers, we have these green marks, uh, green signs um, that will usher you down by the steps down to um, the ground floor and then we meet around in University College London Quad if there is um, a fire alarm, but we're not expecting any practices um, today. Just a little advance warning that the meeting is being live streamed. A number of people who would like to join us but couldn't be here physically, so the morning session will be streamed live so people will be able to hear the presenters and hear questions from the audience but not see any of your faces. Um, but if you have any concerns about that, please do come and see me during the lunch break. We have some feedback forms uh, which are going to be given out towards the end of the meeting, um, but also there is, sorry if I move on the slides, there is a link um, on the website, an opinion poll, where if you'd like to give us some feedback, positive or negative, um, we always welcome all constructive criticism and certainly uh, recommendations and suggestions of things that you would like to see or hear talked about and discussed at future meetings. Um, and there are many, many people um, to try and introduce you to um, who are listed here, um, many members of the team who very kindly helped organize today's meeting, like Ivana, um, and also Eva Tate, who's here from uh, the National Brain Appeal, if you want to talk to anyone about fundraising, um, and many m other members of the team who I hope you'll get to meet um, over the lunch break. Just before we move on to me introducing our morning speakers, Jackie Hussey and Nikki Zimmerman, um, I just wanted to take a moment um, to think, well, what do we mean by carers? Um, it's a word we use, use quite easily, quite sometimes a little flippantly perhaps, and which doesn't always sit very comfortably uh, for many people who find themselves in a role of providing some kind of support or, or walking a journey alongside someone living with a rarer dementia. Um, and I came across, I don't know if ever any of you have seen this wonderful book um, called What Dementia Teaches Us About Love um, by Nikki Gerard, a renowned author and writer. Um, she, uh, I had the pleasure of meeting her when she was in the process of writing this book. Um, and whilst I'd recommend it wholeheartedly to you, I shan't spend the meeting reading it all out loud, but there are a couple of passages um, which I thought might be um, helpful just to open the meeting, just to, as we think about the very wide variety of backgrounds and experiences that may have brought you to be with us here today. Let me just read you a couple of brief passages. To care. To be careful, never careless or carefree. To be careworn, to be a carer. We say it easily, indiscriminately, carelessly. Carer is a word in whose small frame lives a great jostle of seething emotions, an army of feelings that collide and crash, while all the time the image is one of saintliness a serene self-sacrifice in the name of duty and affection. In the same way, the word caregiver has a troubling ambiguity about it. It makes care seem like an object rather than a process. And it presents the act of caring as a gift, something one person generously and self-sacrificially offers and that others receive, implying a lack of reciprocity. Some people prefer careful new term, care partner. And then just one more short passage I wanted to share. Caring can be exhausting, farcical, revelatory, horrifying, enriching, tragic. In the act, the physical and the emotional fuse. People find themselves, lose themselves, give things up and take things on, are diminished and expanded, behave terribly and beautifully, are proud of themselves and ashamed, never do well enough and do more than one could possibly be expected of them. Carer, there should really be another word. So just with those uh, thoughts and very different experiences in mind. Um, it's a real pleasure to be able to welcome um, to for today's meeting uh, Jackie Hussey, who's a consultant old age psychiatrist and has great experience of walking alongside and supporting carers, people living with different forms of dementia, 
and those experiencing these challenges in many different ways. Um, Jackie uh, does fantastic work, not just through um, traditional NHS memory clinics, um, but also through her charity working specifically with younger people with dementia. And it's about that latter work that Jackie's very kindly agreed um, to come and talk to us today. So whatever situation you find yourself in, um, whether today is a good day or a bad day, whether you've been delighted to come or dragged yourself along, you're very welcome. And please help me in joining, uh, join me in welcoming Jackie. Thanks. Um, first of all, yes, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I work in Berkshire, so I appreciate that everyone's come from far and wide. So when you're hearing about the, the model of um, kind of care delivery that we offer, um, just try and think that maybe some, some elements of this could, could be available in your area. It's about where you find them sometimes. So as um, Seb mentioned, I'm a jobbing old age psychiatrist. Um, that, that's my day job, and um, alongside that, um, I'm going to talk to you about a charity that I'm very involved with. Um, the charity is for younger people with dementia, but a lot of people that we support have rarer forms of dementia. Um, and I thought of the kind of the overlap, really, with having a young onset dementia and a rarer dementia. Um, quite often, um, there are these similarities. It takes longer to get a diagnosis. You'll all be in this room with your own experiences of that. Um, people with rarer dementias actually tend to be um, on the younger side. Symptoms are often less well understood and viewed really as more challenging. And that's often because professionals feel out of their comfort zone as much as um, kind of the, the, the person having um, different needs. Um, and because things are rarer, um, often people have less access to, to very tailored support that is required. Um, and the demographics of trying to set up a service are kind of fraught, really, because if you have a rare dementia or a young onset dementia, there's usually quite a, a wide geographical spread. So getting people together is often difficult. Um, it's because of small numbers, but we know that, that these are people, um, people that, that um, you are um, supporting, living with, um, will have high care needs. Um, and where there are services, often they're set up as pilots. Um, they kind of show, yes, really good short-term um, um, success, but the commissioning is very much project-based, so it doesn't last for very long. So you hear of kind of areas doing really, really well, and then five years later you're thinking, well, what, what happened to that organisation? Um, so we set up the charity back in 2012, um, and we have had then the single aim, and it's still our aim, to provide meaningful activity and respite for younger people living with dementia. So that's both the person and carers. Um, and we said that, you know, actually where there are services, um, this isn't about competition, this is about where are the gaps, how could we as a charity fill those gaps. Um, and what we wanted for younger people was to provide something across the working week hopefully to try and keep some carers in work. Um, and as I said, we've got the title Berkshire, so we're based in Berkshire. So how did we get there? I mean, I think the first thing that we did way before 2012 was we set up a forum, um, a bit like this. Forums work, get people that are like-minded, have similar um, kind of difficulties together. Often they have solutions to, to problems. We also did an awful lot of networking um, and I relied a lot on, on the um, kind of goodwill of my staff in the Wokingham Memory Clinic. So we started off in the forum saying, actually what people need is a, a place to get together. So once a month we started going on walks. We met outside Tesco's. My kids would go, oh, where are we going today? And they'd go, oh, we're going off somewhere. So actually we all gave of our time. Um, and when I'd say, oh, we're having fish and chip night, my and we go, is it with young, younger people with dementia? Yeah, and it's going to be great. So people just gave of their time, really. But we realised that, that we couldn't keep doing that and we needed something a bit more kind of, um, a bit more that was a, of a concept, really. So alongside two carers, myself, my secretary, um, and a couple of retired folk, um, we set up the, the charity. And we managed, Berkshire's a bit unique. We have six local authorities. At the time, we had seven PCTs, now called CCGs, so the clinical commissioning groups. Who do you go to? 
when they're, they're, there's such a, you know, how do you get 13 um, kind of um, commissioners on board? But we managed to get three local authorities in the west of Berkshire give us £20,000 each for a year. Um, and that allowed us to take on our first employee, who was someone that was working in the NHS, one of my best support workers, who we kind of, um, she came and worked for us and um, helped set up the charity. Um, other things have happened along the way, so it's kind of, it really has been a journey. We actually started off saying we wouldn't employ staff, um, and we now employ 13 staff and quite a few volunteers. Um, we got the, um, managed to, to have the um, first Admiral Nurse specifically for young onset dementia. Um, we got funding for that. Um, and over time, we managed to get to that five day provision in um, the west of Berkshire, where those three local authorities helped set it, give us some money to set it up. And now um, an equal provision in the east of the county. Um, and we did all of this under the umbrella of carer respite. So when we went to the local authority, we said, you've got £20,000, we'd like that for carer respite. And they went, the model I will describe, they went, that doesn't really sound like carer respite, that sounds like services for people with young onset dementia. And we went, yep, and that's how you provide carer respite. Because my experience of working in the memory clinic, and if I'd had a, a person with a rarer dementia or a young onset dementia, all I could offer was the, the day center, um, average age 82. And actually, most of the time, it's carers that decide where people go. And actually, you know, I wouldn't go anywhere myself if it wasn't for a good reason. So I think it's about offering meaningful activity. And I think for carers, they don't want their their relative to be sat in a place where they haven't got those social connections, they can't really interact in the way that you'd want them to. So if it's not good enough, carers vote with their feet, they say no thank you. So um, we managed to persuade them that this was carer respite. So this is what we do, I'm sorry, it's probably very small print. Um, I'll just let you have a read of um, the sorts of things that we offer. A whole variety of things. Um, we, what we do is we send out um, a prospectus every six weeks um, and people can choose. So each day there are different things going on. So someone could look at the prospectus and decide for the next six weeks that they're going to do badminton on a Monday, um, go out on the Catter Canoes on the River Thames on um, Tuesday, um, go to choir in the afternoon. Um, I can see on your seats that you, there's a lot around music um, therapy and there's been a lot about the, the, the choir on, on the BBC. Um, when we set up the choir, it's by far our most um, popular um, group. We, we have um, a, a choir mistress, um, so she's someone who we, we employ to, to, to run the choir. People go to choir practice, otherwise why would you go, you know? Um, and we put on performances. And the songs that people sing are from an era that they would remember songs. So um, it could be Carpenters, um, I don't know, we haven't quite done Def Leppard. Um, but we've also done new songs because my, and, and I think what kind of setting up the charity has done for me is fly in the face of things that I was taught as a junior doctor. So actually, you know, the rationale was let's have songs that people can remember singing in their teens. Um, and it becomes very, very inclusive. Um, a couple of months ago, um, they were singing Budapest by George Ezra, and I think, how's this gonna work? Because it's quite a difficult tune. Um, we have a harmony, um, so some two sections, so we s people sing in harmony. Week two, everyone, everyone was singing Budapest. So, it, you know, it is quite amazing. Um, so there's a whole range of different groups that we run. So people can be doing um, these groups throughout the working week. Okay. Um, there are things, so you set up something and then people come to you with, oh, well, what we also need is this. Um, and I think kind of working with the charity um, alongside the NHS, you can respond a bit more easily if you're part of a charity. Um, so um, for some time we were running an education course for um, people, it's what we do generically in our memory clinic. Our carers that were younger or had maybe a relative with PCA said, yeah, that's really good, but actually some of it wasn't quite relevant. I had, I had some very specific questions. 
So we actually got everyone together. Um, the, the way to get anyone together if you want to set something up is to have a curry night. So we've said, have a curry night, come and tell us what you think. And people in the room said, we want it in the, well, everyone bar one said we would like the group in the evenings. Um, we said, look, we've got the course, you help us write it and make it relevant for you. And the people with dementia in the room said, excuse me, we'd like a course too. So what we've been doing now is we run an education course. They run in parallel at the same time in the evening. We have a little uh, sandwich in between. And we have both groups have um, a, a six-week education course. Um, carers said, can we have our own support group? So our Admiral Nurses, because we've now got two Admiral Nurses, um, alongside a home care agency called Banyan, and the charity run the carer support group and a drop-in, which is every um, month. We also have, and I don't like the term, but it is essentially an ex-carers support group. So where maybe someone's um, sadly died or their partner's gone into um, care, uh, kind of nursing home care, what the supporters have said is actually we miss the charity. Um, so this is a way for them to connect. They, they run it. Um, they have the time of their lives that they're always posting on Facebook where they've been. Um, they have a much better social life than, than I do. Um, we, um, because of links with here and um, Jill Walton, um, we have been running for um, a few years now a regional PCA support group where we try and put the dates in tandem with what's going on here so that people can access, um, come up to London um, and then the other months um, we'll run our group. And tomorrow is our first regional um, contratemporal support group. So we've got eight people signed up for that, which is good. Um, just seeing your book, other spin-offs, we've got a YPWD library. Um, and what we've started doing is recommending a book. Um, so it's a bit like the Richard and Judy book group. We have the YPWD and Bell Bookshop in Henley um, recommendation. So we've just actually recommended um, a book by Steph Booth. Um, who's written about her experience of um, supporting her husband, Tony, who's Cherie Blair's father. Um, so there's lots of spin-offs um, from, from kind of our day job, which is providing those, those workshops throughout the week. The elements of the model, which I think make this kind of unique and hopefully sustainable, is that we are absolutely embedded within the NHS service. Now, that, that's kind of my luxury, because I work in the NHS. But... Um, I think sometimes charities can feel a bit tokenistic. Um, yes, yes, we, we, we do stuff for the voluntary sector. Actually, everyone that works for the charity has an honorary contract with the NHS clinic. So what that allows them to do is that they can put onto the notes the patient's electronic note system. And what I find is that my secretary will say, oh, this person's up for review. I look on the notes, and actually the charity are telling me what they've been doing every day for the last you know, five months. I don't need to see them, perhaps, but actually when someone hasn't turned up for a choir, let's say, for two weeks, they become my early warning system. This person hasn't turned up, I phone them, they're feeling a bit, a bit low at the moment. We fast track them into clinic, so that works really well. It really is seamless working. And we have supervision, so there are, there are six teams in Berkshire, six memory clinics. We have supervision um, with those teams every six weeks. Um, and we started off with the charity staff attending the training for the, um, with the NHS. The charity now put on the training for the NHS, so um, that works well. Um, I think the key thing is that this model was set up with carers and they continue to feed into that. Can we have, not everything's a gift, is it? But if we can do it, we'll, we'll, we'll look at it. That's how the PCA support group came about. We had one of our um, carers saying, I well, it was Helen and Den, for, the, for those who know Helen and Den, said, actually, could we run something um, locally? That's what we've done. Um, I've kind of said this, but I think the whole point of respite um, and for activities is for it to be meaningful. So um, you know, we have very, very clear goals for, for anything that people are signing up to. And what we've found along the way is there's a real social capital to, to, to this model. Um, people make connections. Um, for the people with dementia, it helps them to retain their skills, sometimes learn new skills. Um, but, but there becomes a real social connection. People, people feel, rather than isolated, they feel connected. Um, so who do we support? Just thinking of rarer dementias. Um, so 
the, the, the biggest, um, the, the, the blue area here is um, young onset Alzheimer's disease, but here we have um, a, a group of people with frontotemporal dementia, um, people with Parkinson's disease, dementia, PCA, um, and various kind of um, speech variants of, of dementia. Um, I thought I'd give you, um, how are we doing for time, just, just a couple of case scenarios because you might think, well, yeah, that's great, isn't it? But that won't apply to my husband or that won't apply for my wife. And sometimes that is the case in which, which um, in those cases, we will try and offer some one-to-one -one support. Um, but this is a scenario, um, not, it's an abridged history, so, so some of this is fact. But a, um, a lady who was um, being asked to stop working, she was put on garden leave, because um, colleagues were struggling with her. Um, her personality was a little bit tricky. Um, things were tricky at home. She had two teenage sons. Um, her husband wanted a, a divorce because of what he felt was her unreasonable behavior. Um, when she came to clinic, she had over-inclusive speech, clear semantic difficulties. She'd been knocking on the door, trying to get a diagnosis for over four years. Um, because of that, things were quite fractured at home, really. Um, there had been four years of everyone struggling with her diagnosis of what turned out to be a semantic dementia. Um, in terms of this lady's personhood, she's someone that um, liked to play in the orchestra. Every time she turned up with her violin, she was sent away because, um, again, they, they found her um, not quite fitting into the, the nice little um, village circle. Um, she liked to go to um, the gym, she liked to go to cross country, she liked to walk, walk a lot, mainly to go and pick up litter, and that was a problem because of her road safety. Um, so she came to the charity, and when I say charity, this is working alongside the NHS as well. And um, if you think of her problem list, and sometimes I'll do this with um, junior doctors, I'll say, well, this, this is this person's problems. She's got poor verbal fluency, um, she's very wedded to routines. She's foraging for litter. Um, she used to play in an orchestra. That's a real loss of role for her. Carer stress is high, um, and she's on garden leave. How are you going to manage this? So what we found was, um, could we sublimate? She can't play the violin, um, but maybe she can appreciate music in a different way. So she came to the choir, absolutely loved it, always wanted to play the Carpenters, so we always, we ended up singing Carpenters, you know, a song, <coughs> um, sorry, on one of our shows. Um, with the gym, we had a, a support worker to, to enable her to still go to the gym. Um, we um, invited her to the walking group, so again, um, if she was physically um, tired, she might not go foraging for litter at night. Um, and then we had a revelation, I don't know if people have come across um, Turtle Key Arts, but they work with, um, kind of uni for us, they work with the University of Reading music students. Um, and for a nine week program, they, they literally put on a kind of mini concert at the end. And this particular lady played the violin um, and we put on a show. And uh, for her daughter, um, she sat in the audience, she said, I haven't seen my mother smile in 10 years. Um, and that, that, was, that, that was really inspiring. Um, and we were fortunate that we have a dementia care advisor specifically for young onset dementia. We had the Agile nurse um, and um, we were able to offer the husband some counselling. And we did a lot of liaising with, the, um, with her employers so that she, rather than her being sacked, she was medically retired. Um, second case, um, so this is a 58 year old gentleman. This is kind of true and he gives permission um, he owned his own IT company, married with grown-up children, physically well, um, but started getting um, some problems with coordination, struggled with locks and using cutlery, um, also had a lot of expressive um, word-finding difficulties, struggled with reading and writing, had to give up work. <coughs> He's someone that loved doing art, um, loved cycling, um, had a diagnosis of um, posterior cortical atrophy. And again, this is his care plan, so the choir. And although he really, really struggled, felt quite um, on the edge of groups because of his um, speech problems, could sing fluently um, at the choir. 
and he would say that for about the rest of the day, his, his kind of verbal um, communication seemed to improve after singing. Um, even though he had lots of kind of um, balance problems, we managed to get him into the Kata canoes, which is essentially two canoes strapped together. Um, sounds risky. We, we, we went as a staff group on the, the Kata canoes. We tried to tip them. We couldn't. We started off when we, we had um, first started doing this group, um, having the Kata canoes out on the lake. Somehow that just felt safer. But now we're out on the River Thames. Um, and um, yeah, they'll be out tomorrow on, on the River Thames. We take three Kata canoes out. Um, once this chap was in the Kata canoe, he could paddle, and um, that was great for him. We ran um, a, a cycle group, so we, did, we hire a velodrome, so it, again, it's a safe environment, have adaptive bikes, so it, he loves cycling. In an adaptive bike, he could continue his cycling. Um, we run shared reading groups, as an example, so although he can't, um, can no longer read, he could be part of the discussion because we'd all take it in turns to, to read aloud. Um, his art, he was really worried about doing the art group because he'd been a very good artist. He just used different media and um, one of our support workers kind of got him doing some amazing stuff with a fork. He could manage a fork, he couldn't manage a paintbrush. Um, and the, the, the same thing with the carer um, kind of support. Um, Okay, so that's proof that it really does happen. The, these are real photographs. Um, equine therapy is another really, really um, kind of um, popular group. Um, people absolutely love the equine therapy. But, but we will do all sorts. And you might say, again, um, well, I'll just tell you. So we're busy. This is how many workshops we've run um, in the, the west and the east in the last six months so that the staff really don't stop. And additionally, we, we offer some one-to-one -one support. Usually, the one-to-one -one support is kind of time-limited for six weeks to try and introduce someone into the group. Um, this is a bit of a complicated table, but I'll just talk you through it. So this is the age range of people that we support and the average age, so average age of 63. Um, We've looked at, um, we measure the standardized um, mini mental state examination. Not the best measure for um, people with rarer dementias, um, but we looked at 30 people. What we don't want is we want people to come to the charity and have uh, kind of make those social connections. We don't want them to feel like they're being assessed. But because we've got the, the contract with the NHS, we can just pull off their scores from the memory clinics. Um, and as you can see, um, so with an MMSE score, it's out of 30. People with a score of 27 will be quite high functioning in terms of their, their cognitive abilities. And there's a huge range. We, and, and, you know, again, that flies in the face of anything that I might have thought. Actually, can you have people with really different abilities in groups? I think this shows that you can. Um, and we've kind of, we, we can track people. So we've looked at their... Their, their scores over time. And they kind of, you know, I'm not saying that, that we are, we found a cure for um, people's cognitive disorder, but, but people seem to maintain skills for, for a bit longer. Um, we also measure something called the neuropsychiatric inventory. That's a, a 12 um, item um, measure of things that would be viewed as more kind of um, psychological um, symptoms or, or challenging behavior. So it asks about delusion, delusions, hallucinations, apathy, um, depression, anxiety. Um, so on the MPI, um, the higher the score, there will be more of those symptoms. And again, what this shows is that there's, my pointer's gone, but there's quite a range. People, people ha there are people that are very disinhibited alongside people that are very forgetful, um, but it seems to work. And again, their scores are, I think for this cohort of people, these are low scores. So there is low kind of behavioral and psychological symptoms. One carer summed it up for me. She said, I love Tuesdays when we, we had the running club. Um, her husband used to run around a, a running track for an hour with, this is before we kind of really got workers in. So I used to do it after work. And I'm not a runner, not a natural runner. That's what people told me when I was doing the Reading Half Marathon. She's not a natural runner. Um, but we would literally just run with him, um, and he always slept that night. So if you're asking how do people sleep, and they've actually done some meaningful activity during the week, 
then they're probably going to sleep and they'll be low on those scores. So it kind of just feels intuitively right. Um, what have been the main obstacles? Because I'm aware that sometimes I go through this and it, people go, oh, that's wonderful. But actually, we've been kind of de developing this over the last seven years. Um, integrating the notes with the NHS was quite hard. People are very precious about their... Well, rightly so. It's, it's things around confidentiality. Will the charity workers be able to push onto the progress note in the same way? Yes, actually, they do really, really good notes because we train them and say, this is what I need to know when I'm looking at the notes. So they will say, Mr. So-and-so, um, hallucinations um, were, were really apparent when he arrived out on the Katakanoo. Um, he didn't mention them once. That's really important. Or so-and-so didn't play his guitar in choir today. Um, I'm wondering about his, you know, his, I asked about his mood, he seems a bit low. Um, so I just went to the chief executive and that's how we got integration with the NHS notes. Um, there was a little bit of kind of worry around the negative, um, around the kind of risks. Um, and my answer to, to, to that really is there is more risk to apathy than going out on the River Thames personally. So. Um, that usually shuts people up. Um, the geographical boundaries continue to be difficult because Berkshire is a kind of, you know, a, a, a wide county. So we go from um, Hungerford, if people know Hungerford, all the way to Slough. So, you know, we, we have to run groups um, all over, really. Um, so that, that's quite difficult. And always the money. We get some money from the clinical commissioning groups and the rest we fundraise. Um, so... If anyone, uh, I guess my message is for, for carers, we got this charity set up because carers came to me and said, we, we had that curry evening and they said, it's rubbish, it's absolutely rubbish. Our lives are rubbish. And, you know, that's quite hard to ignore. So we kind of said, okay, we'll, we'll do this. We'll do a, a couple of things. And we just built from there. And I think that that's, that's kind of our mantra that obstacles are stepping stones. Thank you. Jackie, thank you for a fantastic talk. It's really inspiring, and particularly um, just to see that kind of can do attitude attached to a real vision and clinical now. So it's fantastic. So thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, we have a couple of microphones doing the rounds. Would anybody else, anybody like to ask Jackie some questions? Yes. Thank you for all of this out over the whole country. My yeah. <coughs> partnership. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. I mean, it, it's always difficult. I think, you know, what works is because it's so well integrated with the NHS. I think, you know, if you can demonstrate the win-wins, um, we have had approaches. Um, it will always come down to persuading commissioners. Um, and I think, you know, we're, we're always very happy to come around the, the country and talk to local providers. Um, yeah, and I think probably what you have to, the, 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 the kind of buzzword still is, we want to do a project or a pilot and, and see what, d then demonstrate. And I think, again, the strength of this and me working in the, in the NHS is I can blast them with outcome measures. I can go and look at the MPIQ scores. Um, there aren't that many kind of um, perhaps local charities that can do that. So I think, you know, we set this up thinking about how are we going to show that this works? And... You know, they can hear lots of lovely stories from, from carers who, who write in, and we certainly use those, but actually what they're interested in is, is that going to keep people out of hospital or care homes? And I go, not going down that road, but we'll give you proxy measures so we know that high carer stress, high behavioural, behavioral and psychological symptoms are independent uh, predictors of people going into a home. We will measure those. Other questions? Yes. Just a very simple one. I wonder whether you charge people to attend or do anything. Is it fully funded? Um, no, we don't charge people. Um, that's, that's kind of something I feel quite passionate about. Um, we, we know from working with older people um, and when things changed to, that people had to, um, they used to get daycare for free and then it changed. Lots of day centres closed. People that can afford it don't always want to spend that money that way. Um, so we've actually said to the, to the commissioners, look, we can save you money, look at this, we've saved you this amount of money by 
this, this equates to three people not going into you know, nursing home care for a year. We've delayed that. Um, okay. But, um, you know, it's, it's a challenge. Um, we don't get any uplifts, you know, and, and things change in the charity sector, you know, GDPR, you have to get more admin in, you have to pay people pensions nowadays. So we've never had an uplift. So that, that's why we fundraise. We, we fundraise for probably just over a third, and then we get the rest from the, the clinical commission groups. Yes, a couple more questions at the front there. Do you have a website on which your services are described? Yes, so sorry, I should have put that up. Maybe we can persuade our local authority and our local okay. PCGs to yeah, work it's along. It's quite easy if people want to write it down. So it's www.ypwg.info. And we can also share that in the notes after the meeting. Thank you. Um, I'm coming along to your first FDD group tomorrow. Oh, how lovely. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Um, I wanted to ask, is there a cutoff? You, you're called younger people with dementia. What, is there a sort of cutoff age? How, how do you define younger? When does someone become an old person yeah. with dementia? Yeah. I mean, it, it sounds arbitrary. It's kind of the World Health Organization definition of um, we, we work to kind of onset of symptoms before the age of 65. Um, yeah. In terms of our reporting to clinical commissioning groups, you know, we, we kind of have to stick to that. Um, but we have also said people that are, you know, 62 at the age of diagnosis grow older, providing that they can, you know, access um, the, the workshops and benefit from them. Age isn't an absolute barrier at all. So we've got um, one lady who's, who's in her very early 70s mm. who goes to, you know, six workshops a, a week still. Um, I think the other, the other kind of neat thing about this model is that there is an exit strategy and it's always very, very difficult as people get more impaired. Um, they might, you know, they might always have loved um, the badminton and now they can't do it. Um, what we do is probably we just don't run it. So we have six weeks, we have a break week, then we send out the, the new prospectus. So, you know, actually, we, we just stopped running certain groups. The choir has always run, um, and we've got 23 people with dementia plus their carers attend. So some groups, so the choir is, um, so again, from feedback, um, carers said, actually, sometimes it's about doing things together and making memories, new memories together. So the choir um, is for carers as well. So there's probably about 45 people in the choir at the moment. Um, the walking group, we run two parallel walking groups, one for people with dementia, um, one for carers that carers can, can talk along the way, meet at the end for um, coffee and cake. Um, and then most of the other groups, um, carers are dropping off um, for just for people at home. Did I answer your question? Sorry. Okay. <laughs> a couple of questions down this corner. Just while the microphone's coming, can I just ask, um, do you, do the people who belong and make contact, you talk about the social capital, are there sort of spill out informal groups where people are making friendships and seeing each other in between sessions? Yeah, and apparently workshops? so. Oh, no. Do you always uh, get invited? No, never, oh. never been invited. Um, but the education course that we ran, I think, seven years ago, that group still meet up every month, okay. which was lovely. Okay. Okay. Lovely. Okay. Caregiver stress and the actual diagnosis Okay, so thank you. That's a good question because I didn't really highlight that on the slides. Um, when we do this, this um, inventory called the um, Neuropsychiatric Inventory, the MPI, there's, um, it asks, you know, um, does the person, or, or it might be an it can be an observer rating, does the person seem anxious? And you give a score. And then you ask the carer, so it might be, yes, they're having visual hallucinations every day and they're, they're really intrusive. Then you ask the carer, how distressed do you find that? So you get a carer rating um, scale based on the person with dementia's symptoms. Which, again, you know, I always worry a little bit about you know, saying to the CCGs, we'll, 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 we'll show you that carer stress goes down. Because actually for any individual, 
you can do a, a carer rating and actually the other life events independent of their caring role can happen and, and, and that kind of, you know, when you're dealing with small numbers that skews your scores. So this is about matching the, the distress to the person's symptoms and that's, that's what we report on. No, 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 it's, it's, I have to credit Cummings et al, because it is copyrighted. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a validated scale that we use, yes. Just a couple more questions. Uh, Graham. Uh, thank you. Uh, two very quick questions. W one, is it, is it limited to residents of Berkshire? Um, and, and secondly, I just wondered if you'd had, uh, my wife has PCA, we used to cycle a lot, and I'd be very interested to know if, if it's, if a person with PCA could manage a tandem with a, a sighted person on the front. I just wondered if any experience of that. That's a general question for everybody, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so the, 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 the first question about is it just for people in Berkshire? Obviously, we are getting two thirds of our kind of funding. Um, so the commissioners would be very interested that, that we have people from Berkshire. What we've always said is if we have any spare spaces in the workshops, some are, some are limited just by we want to have community venues. So it might be that we just run one for eight. They're always going to be full. But there are others like a walking group. Um, so if people want to come along from Surrey, Hampshire, then, then we say it's a fiver. Um, in terms of PCA, I think that would be very much based on people's balance, the sensation. What worked for, for um, our guys was they had the bikes that are a bit like, um, they've got three wheels and they're, they're kind of, um, yeah, um, but, but a little bit more extended out. Um, and th there was no stopping our guys with PCA, but I think it was the, the, the tripod actually, because obviously if you're on the back, um, I, I think that would be, personally, I think that would be quite difficult. But as I've always said, I'm always surprised. I think I know, and then I don't. <laughs> Jackie, thank you. Oh, sorry. Jeff, one more question. Um, if you say it, and I'll repeat yeah, the question. I'm a firm believer in music for the brain. And anybody that saw the program last week with Seb in it, starring, <laughs> um, will just see what music does for people with dementia. Um, I, I belong to a, well, I volunteer for a couple of groups, one music therapy and one singing. And to see people advance dementia playing instruments and singing is just, you know, heart rending. So I would recommend anybody that can get to a singing group or a music therapy group to give it a go. Um, it's they just remember music. Yeah. Thank you. So, so if, if the mic wasn't on, it, it's about the, the merits of, of singing and absolutely would endorse that from the experience of our charity. So thank you. Okay. Well, Jackie, thank you so much for coming today. Um, I know you have to rush back this afternoon for another busy clinic, but we're really grateful for you, you coming and sharing your experience. It's really um, exciting and visionary. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, just before we have lunch, I thought I would uh, like to take the opportunity to introduce you, if you haven't had the privilege of meeting her before, uh, to Nikki Zimmerman, uh, who joined uh, Rare Dementia Support around the beginning of the year and has been doing a great um, job in working with us to envisage um, how Rare Dementia Support could support you better and how we can build and improve the service um, over the months and years to come. So, Nikki, um, just by way of introduction for those who haven't met you before, could you say a little bit about yourself and perhaps your background? Yeah, sure. So, um, I'm Nikki Zimmerman. I, um, I started getting interested in dementia when my father got early onset dementia and I was studying sociology and public health and the sort of two came together. Um, so, I have... 13 years personal experience of being a carer and um, when I came to London about eight years ago I started working for the Alzheimer's Society. So I did lots of different roles with the Alzheimer's Society, um, set up dementia advisor services, 
worked with commissioners, worked with care homes, um, and then more recently I spent three years doing the London Neurology Project, which was based in two neurology departments, at Queen Square at the National Neurology Hospital and at St George's, where I worked fundamentally with the clinicians. I was in the clinics, I went through all the assessments, I did pre diagnostic support, post-diagnostic support. I'm, I think I've seen a few of you here when I was in the clinic, so it's still nice to see you again. Um, and we looked at how it was very different for younger people, people with rare uh, forms of dementia, what the lack of support was out there, the lack of understanding that was out there. Um, I did three years with them and then finished last year. And uh, over that time, I've built up some very good relationships uh, primarily at the National Hospital with uh, Professor Fox and with uh, Kath Mumry. And um, I was very lucky they wanted me to come back. So um, I met with Seb, actually, the day before Christmas Eve. Both of us having families, I don't know how we had time to do this, but we met for coffee and said, we'll, we'll do some work together. He, we sort of knew a bit about each other's sort of background. Um, things were changing with rare dementia support and um, he wanted to see if we could bring some of my skills from being out in the community um, but also being within the clinics could sort of help move things forward. So I started in January primarily with the uh, PPA group and now I'm working with all the groups and with the development of this service going forward and the new centre we're looking forward to having. I suppose it feels very timely having just um, heard from uh, Jackie about this seamless and very vital, in my opinion, connection between the National Health Service and more charitable services. Um, th and this sense that there are so many things that get missed if you have a very prescribed service that only offers service or support within tightly defined boundaries. And I wondered if you could say a little bit about, I know holistic care is, some, is, a, is a word or a phrase that you use quite a lot. I wondered if you could say a little bit about what that means to you or for you. Yeah, I think uh, that was one of the really important parts that I felt that and I was working in clinic because it, it's quite prescriptive in clinic. It's, you know, you go in for an assessment or you go in for review and it tends to sort of work on sort of your cognitive abilities or any sort of particular uh, personality changes, sight changes, hallucinations, things like that. And it's all the other things that are going on outside the clinic room, you know, the family setter, the social environment, what people... Uh, aren't doing anymore, the things they are doing now, what help they need with, all the, and there's so many different things like financial advice, uh, lasting power of attorney, you making future plans, making sure people are getting all the benefits that they should get, um, and actually looking at that person as a whole person and what interests do they, do they like and what can we actually um, encourage people to continue doing to keep those life skills and it's really important that we don't put people into boxes of you know although singing is great I think it's absolutely fantastic and I really must learn to sing at some point because I'm feeling very lost on this part of it um, or art therapy but there's lots of other things I mean you just look at the list that Jackie brought up and god I'm moving to Berkshire definitely a hundred percent because there's so many fantastic things that are that people do, but there's not all the ways, the places that they're available. So it's so trying to work with people so they can still get so much out of their life without them having to suddenly become Picasso or Pavarotti to go along with it. So, uh, you know, it was it's really about getting to know people and shaping services around people because that, that's what we want. We need to learn from you people. You know, we, we can't sort of say, oh, we want to do this in the future unless we get input from you to tell, tell us what, what you need, what's going to be useful. Uh, another part of Jackie's talk which I really liked, which we've talked about a lot before, is the importance of food and meeting <coughs> together and your, your curry that you had uh, reminds me of how the PCA support group started here, the groups for people with visual um, difficulties, which was very much the key element of these meetings has always been lunch. And then, you know, with all due respect to Jackie and Nikki, we fit the speakers in around the sandwiches. Um, but it's that critical, it's that social bond, that connection, that opportunity to meet other people in a similar boat. And so how do you see that's 
within Rare Dementia Support, we have this network of meetings and wonderful people like Jackie and many others running regional um, facilitated groups um, with the help of Roberta and others around the country. How do you see Rare Dementia Support getting better, stronger, being able to support people more holistically? We, I suppose for a while we were on a sort of inf information provision yeah. footing. I think you want to see us being a bit more proactive. What yeah. will that look like? Yeah, I think yeah, coming in sort of from a different sort of angle, working from a charity where they ask people everything, all their information, down to what colour socks they're wearing every day, to sort of coming in where it has been very much information provision, so it's very easy to sign up on the website to get information from us, but we don't really know much information about you. So it's looking at where people are in the country, what their interests are, what, why they're signing up, why, why do they want to be part of it? Are they a person that's diagnosed themselves? Are they a family member? Are they a carer? Have they just got somebody down the road that they want to help, but they, they need some more information? Or are they a professional? So it's gathering that information, which I really sort of want to start working on. So we can actually see sort of throughout the country and actually throughout the world, because I, I must say I probably get about 10 emails from America each month sort of you know looking for support as well but finding out where people are in the country and seeing where we can match up people you know if i can sort of say oh i've got five people in <coughs> bristol that all have got pca then actually we can put those hopefully put those people in contact with each other and suggest go out and have a curry because i'm going to be there for that one as well i think you know that personal introduction is very important um but also it's for them to, for people to start looking at their own local areas and actually look at commissioning, because if you have got ten people in one area, you, you know, you there is that sort of, you know, looking forward to yes, we can do something ourselves, but we actually might be able to get some help with this. The local authority might give us a grant. There's lots of community fundraising schemes, you know, actually giving people sort of that step up the ladder. Um, and I know you're going to be here over lunchtime and for the rest of the afternoon talking with people um, about what their wishes would be. But I guess this was perhaps in the few minutes we had before lunchtime, a good opportunity for you to say any last things that you wanted to share, but also for any of you who would like to, obviously you can speak to Nikki privately over a sandwich, but publicly um, anything you would like to encourage her, us, the rest of the Rare Dementia Support team to look into or to build upon um, as core what you see as core strengths of the service or the things that you would like other people um, to have um, to be supported by as they enter this, this journey. We'd be really interested in that. Nikki, any last comments or requests really for input and ideas from people? Um, well, I did do a couple of slides. I just want to go through these quickly, actually. Where are we? Um, which one are we? Sorry. Is that one? The black one. Oh. Um, I get lots of questions from people all the time, um, emails, which is great, and that's what I'm here for. I am here as support. And um, they always say to me, you know, about prognosis. They've been to see the consultant. Nobody knows anything. And um, how long, you know, what, what, what's going to happen over this sort of time? So um, I always refer them to Muhammad Ali, fantastic philosopher there, of instead of counting how long, making those days count. So don't count the days, make the days count. And it's looking at, you know, you've, we're all here, it's a bit of a journey. Everybody's at different stages, different days, but making sure that, you know, you are not looking forward to what's going to happen right down the end of the line, but making sure important things are put in place every day. Again, this is one I found the other day. No one can change the outcome of dementia, but with the right support, you can change the journey. And that's where we come into it as well now. We are looking at what sort of support that you need to help with your journey. And sometimes people don't like the word journey. Journey should be something fun, to be finding something great at the end. But, you know, when people get a diagnosis of dementia of whatever sort, it's, it takes many years for things to happen quite often. Um, on that journey time, it's a bit like going around London Underground. You're stopping and starting. You're on the wrong tube. You've got to get off. There needs to be a change of driver. Um, different things happen. One uh, carer said to me not long ago, he said, 
Now this journey that I'm on, well, I think I've just got off in Alice in Wonderland. I, said, I really don't know what's going on today. It's just, you know, not, not what I thought was going to happen. And I think throughout the years, throughout the times, different support is needed. And it's just making aware that that support is in place. You know, like uh, Jackie said, you know, that sometimes people can run round tracks for hours and hours and on end. But we know that some people can't do that and they need something else on their journey. So again, it's, it's looking for that support and what can we provide to help with that. And um, this is one of the things that I do send people quite often when they come to me. Um, and it's about um, the Tim Kitwood's Flower of Psychological Need. And it's the caring role, being a carer, being a journey partner um, can be really frustrating but really rewarding as well at the same time and people have all their di you know their ups and downs and difficulties um, and so quite often people say to me is there not just a blueprint that's going to tell me exactly what's going to go on and, and we don't have that but we do have things which can help you understand and um, this is the flow of psychological needs which we all need this isn't made just for somebody with dementia but it's looking at the different petals on there and um, making sure that people have those things in place that, so they can feel supported. And um, quite often I refer to the occupation petal here, and that is part of that person's sort of role. And somebody could have been a CEO of a big financial company making the most um, important de uh, decisions in life at one point, and then, you know, when you get dementia, things change for that person. They can't do that role. And people always still need that role to do, to have some task to do. So it might mean that somebody now feels it really important that they can still prepare a meal, make a cup of tea, help with drying the dishes, or walk the dog, help with the grandchildren, whatever it is. But that role of occupation tends to be the, the first thing that people with dementia say to me that they feel that, that they get taken away from them. So I think when I'm talking to carers, um, it's one of the things that I would really like them to sort of look at that role of occupation. If anybody's got any questions. Uh, taking the two sort of um, species, no, whatever, in, in together. I mean, my wife's 72 and she's got mobility issues. Yeah. And the trouble is that she wants to do something, but there's very little, you know, she used to take the dogs for long walks, but she can't really do that now, even, you know, she could, could walk sort of 20, 30 mm -hmm. yards, yeah? Uh, she used to read a lot of books. Well, that's gone out the window. She's got PCA, you know, she just can't read at all now. Um, I mean, we, we try some music groups, but the ones we go to, they're all singing First World War songs. Mm. Well, you know, that's, you know, that's ridiculous. You know, she was a child of the 70s, you know. Um, so maybe Death Leopard, you know, I don't know. Yeah. But um, the point about it is, I mean, A, my worry is what happens when people come to the end of the support process, you know, in Berkshire, I'm worried about these people dropping off the end, <laughs> if you like. Um, because... You know, someone like my wife, she can't do half the things she wanted to do. You know, she used to sew, she used to do upholstery, all these things with the visual problems and the spatial mm -hmm. awareness. You know, she has difficulty getting it out of the house. And that's my worry. I, and the big problem for me as a carer, as I've said before in other places, I have to be the MC. I have to be the person to do that. And I have to be a carer. I can do the caring role, but actually being the entertainment master is, is the leader of the rebels. Yeah. It just doesn't work for me. Have you, have you got some help? Have you got some PA, uh, PA personal assistant, to no, come in and help? No, you? No. I mean, I think, I think as a carer, it, it is exhausting because you've got to be everything, you know, all singing and dancing, everything, and you, it's impossible. You can't do it. You, you know, you will die of exhaustion. So getting some outside help in, and that can quite often be as just a companion, a different face, to be able to take... You know, take your wife in the wheelchair to the park to go and have a look around the shops, to to go to a singing group. It doesn't have to be a special singing for the grain singing 
group, you know, it, it can be just a normal choir. But having somebody to help with that burden, if you've got family members, that's great, but we know that's not, not always possible. And actually, sometimes when you've got family members and think they should be doing part of it, they don't. They really don't quite often. But actually looking at some charities that will have befrienders or even having to pay for that service themselves, it will really, really do you and that person. Such good. I mean, God forbid, you know, if anything happened to me and my husband had to spend 24-7 with me, I, I really think it would drive me round the bend and him as well, you know. It's just actually having another face, somebody else coming in, really makes a difference. That's, that's what we're going to be here for. That's with our support going forward, is we want to help look into that. You know, you know, I'm here. Claire and Siobhan have just started with us. They're going to be doing so. We've got Roberta. She's out there to help looking for things. So we, we do want to have a service where you come to us to ask. And we also work with other charities, you know, the Alzheimer's Society, Age UK, Carers Centres, all these different things, which will also... We can't do it all t ourselves. We've got to work in partnership. Yes, yes, absolutely, yeah. And you know, we want to, instead of keeping it ourselves, we want to give it to lots of other people. I'm just to say, I think that's why you're absolutely right to voice those concerns and those challenges, and that's why increasingly we have to work in a different way, and that's why Nikki's here, why what Jackie's been talking about, working in partnership with organisations like hers. We too have an Admiral Nurse who's going to um, start working with Rare Dementia Support um, in April. Um, and they are part of now, I think there's now 270 Admiral nurses around the country. So whilst the, you know, a, a small group like ours in London can't necessarily provide all the local information, we can tap into networks mm. who do have that local information and fuse those two, like Jackie was talking about, from NHS to charitable, for here, for the, the talking about the blend between specialist information about the condition you're living with, with that local information about support and activities that are available. Those two have to come together for us to be able to help you properly, I agree. that you don't worry about the people in Berkshire. <laughs> um, what, what we would do is do exactly as Nikki um, suggests. We'd, we'd try and get a, so this would then come into a paid service, a supporter that people can still attend the, 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 the workshops because obviously CQC and all of those things. So if someone needs, can still do um, the art or whatever, but they might need someone, you know, almost hand on hand, um, then we would slowly introduce a supporter. Um, what we've done as a, another spin-off, because carers have said, when we can't go to the workshops, you know, it feels like there's a void. Um, we've worked with um, a home care agency to have a kind of specialist um, base. Because what happens if you have PCA, home carers come in, they don't know the right approach. So we've got, we share offices now with a home care agency that are specifically trained for the rarer, um, supporting people with rarer dementias. So we will just try and work with them as much as possible, as much as social services will allow mm -hmm. us to. And that's one thing that we're looking forward to doing sort of in the future as well. We've been approached by a lot of home care agencies saying, you know, these are really rare conditions. We don't quite understand. We really want to support these people as m best we can, but we really need that, that specific information and advice from you, that extra bit of training. So, again, this is one of the other strands going forward that we're going to be working with is, you know, for those external organisations to, to be confident that they are providing a good service. We're very aware that, although we've got lots of people here today, that these are rare dementias and not all medical, social care or voluntary sectors are actually going to know what even some of the acronyms are, let alone the symptoms. But you know, what we want to do is be able to produce resources which helps the professionals help you. And with my bad hearing up from up here to detect the rumbling of tummies. That's uh, mine. <laughs> oh, um, I wanted to um, just say a big thank you again to uh, Jackie and Nikki. I also wanted to tell you that um, over lunchtime there will be a few members of the team who are just going to quickly stand up who would be very um, pleased to talk to you about a variety of topics. Um, Keir Yong, who many of you will know, 
and he's waving now um, in his uh, usual self-deprecating manner, is here and very interested to talk to you about how we can engage professionals more in understanding about some of these rarer conditions and how we, that could promote our education agenda. Um, Paul Kamek is here, um, very keen to have your input. Paul's a key member of the new, very large new research grant we have looking at the value of support groups such as these and would be very pleased to receive your thoughts and input into the design of the project at this early stage. Um, Katrina, or an another member of the legal team, Katrina's here. Um, Katrina very kindly runs the Rare Dementia Support um, a le pilot legal scheme and is very keen to talk uh, in an informal way uh, to any of you who are thinking of using that service or may have legal or practical um, questions that maybe she and her team could possibly help you with. Um, also, Eva Tate, I believe, is here from the National Brain Appeal. Eva's there um, and happy to talk to you if you're um, on the verge of running a marathon or hosting a pajama party or have some grand scheme in mind. Um, Eva, Eva and her team are very um, keen and happy to help you. And also, um, there's a board at the back, which um, Emma Harding, um, who many of you will know, received a suggestion from one of the members um, just asking whether at meetings like these, because they're, they're so well attended, if you have a particular burning desire to meet someone to talk about a particular issue or to share a particular skill, um, we're just piloting this today. You can write it up on the screen. We've absolutely no idea, if I'm, if I'm entirely honest, about how we're going to connect you at the end of a meeting in a room of 100 people. Um, but we're going to try it. So if you have a burning passion or something you want to share with other people and aren't quite sure you're going to make the right co uh, meet the right person over lunchtime, scribble something up there and then we'll be encouraging people to look at that this afternoon. Uh, and this afternoon's sessions will be largely at the back of the room, um, uh, focusing condition-specific tables, if that suits you, with some um, facilitators and prompts on each question. Um, but the real focus for now is to have a sandwich and I hope you will feel able to share something of your own journey, perhaps with someone you've met before, perhaps with someone uh, you haven't met before, um, and to really take advantage of the opportunity that there are lots of people here who know much more about the boat you're um, traveling in at the moment than, than many of us are, um, would otherwise. Thank you very much again to Jackie and Nikki.